Hello, welcome to the Breakthrough Hiring Show. I'm your host, James Manaki. Very excited for today's episode. We are joined by Christian Sutherland Wong. Christian, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me, James. Yes, I am pumped. Before we jump into the topics we have outlined, could you please share a little bit about yourself with everyone? Yeah, happy to. I originally born in Australia and grew up there, spent most of my young adult life there. I came to the States back in 2007, originally to do an MBA. And then where it's taken me from there is I was spent a little bit of time at LinkedIn. And then most recently, I spent the last eight years at Glassdoor, helping to build out Glassdoor. And we're helping to transform Glassdoor into the leading platform for workplace conversations. I can't wait to learn more. So you mentioned you started a small little company called LinkedIn back in the day, right? And I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you were helping them build while you were there. Yeah. So I joined LinkedIn back uh, in 2009 and it was a hand, uh, 300 people, I think. So relatively small for what LinkedIn's become today before the IPO. And uh, I was just attracted to it because I saw it as one of these great examples of a what we used to call web 2.0 or social web companies, but I could see it was going to change how people communicated. And also I think the business model around changing how recruiting works. And it was probably, I think the biggest disruption to recruiting we've seen in decades and it was really cool to be part of it. So I was there for five years. I ran LinkedIn's premium subscription product and business, which was a key part of the way how LinkedIn earned revenue and in allowing for members to upgrade to a premium membership. So that could be job seekers, it could be recruiters or people in sales. And then over time, we started building more deeper offerings for recruiters and for salespeople, but it all came out of premium subscriptions. And so I was there for five years and yeah, had a really fun ride. And it's great to see how LinkedIn has just grown as a company and really transformed how all of us work. Oh yeah, for sure. I pretty much built my entire RPO embedded recruiting business on LinkedIn. Yeah, you can, you can think of like, how would RPO work or how would for so many recruiters, how would their lives work without LinkedIn? It's, there was a time, go back prior to 2003, before LinkedIn was around, where it was really different. So you had to have these Rolodexes and all these contacts. You had this, your, your prized asset. And now and LinkedIn just democratized that and so totally changed the game. But from that, I think allowed recruiting to get even more better and bigger and even more strategic for companies in a bigger way. And so, yeah, I think it's really cool what LinkedIn how it can change the game. Yeah, for sure. I got my first client at Secure Vision through LinkedIn. I was doing posting and whatnot and connecting with, with leaders and talent uh -huh. acquisition and a recruiting leader at Grubhub. I saw one of my posts and <laughs> reached out to me. And I was at the time, literally, it was just me and, and the company. And again, we didn't have any customers. And it wasn't what was really interesting about it was my first customer came from LinkedIn, not my personal network. Like it wasn't like a close friend or anything like that is I got an inbound lead from Grubhub from LinkedIn. That's, it's that's just, wild. Yeah. It's yeah nuts. It just speaks to like the breadth of LinkedIn and also that people trust LinkedIn and people actually go to LinkedIn looking for these opportunities. You know, that you, the example from Grubhub you had, of, I think that's kind of part of the power of the platform is that they've created a very safe space for people to have these kinds of business interactions, but that's really cool. Yeah, I think so. And I think like too, it's they've done a pretty good job over the years dialing into a, a couple different product offerings, or I know it's more than a couple, but they really yeah. haven't strayed too far from their brand or their mission. Like I think that they've done a, yeah. a pretty good job, like dialing into, okay, this is the value we're providing. And what I think is really cool too, is beyond being able to showcase like your skill set and whatnot, it really is just the power of network and, and quite honestly, the power of content, people that choose to post and, and build brand and do these types of things and position themselves as experts. It creates a lot of value for a lot of people. Yes. And it really expands our ability to have, as you said, more than a Rolodex of just maybe a couple hundred people, you can really get exposure in your industry beyond anything that was available before. So it was definitely like a game changer, right? Like a massive yeah. shift in terms of how we go about identifying opportunities, building relationships, recruiting, hiring. It's really just changed everything drastically. Yeah, agreed. And I think your example of Grubhub the, also kind of speaks to, I think, the evolution of the way LinkedIn has added value in our lives. And I think early on, it was very heavily focused on kind of the recruiting conversations. But over time, it's beyond just recruiting now, it's also just building your business in general and making contacts in general. And I think LinkedIn is the place a lot of us think about building our personal brand. So when we have something we want to post to the world, usually it's professionally related or somehow tied to something professionally related. 
LinkedIn is a great platform to do that. And, and it's really cool to see how it's, how LinkedIn's evolved over the years and, and how people use LinkedIn. Yeah, for sure. Think about even this episode, right? Like I'm going to be promoting this episode essentially to my right. LinkedIn network. My, I think 34,000 followers, many wow. of which are like tech executives, right? Yeah. And so just the access to value that we can push out to the world. Like how would I have done that? Newsletters, right? There's certain things that you could do. It really just wasn't accessible before. So I, I think what's really cool about your career too, it's like you started at LinkedIn, which was this massive game changer. And then you went to Glassdoor, which also really fundamentally changed the game in terms of how people think about evaluating potential employment opportunities. And it's become a big part. I don't really know anybody who wouldn't leverage glass store when they're considering working at a new company. Just, I don't really know a whole lot of people who wouldn't leverage LinkedIn. One of my questions I'm really curious to, to learn from you uh, about is fundamentally just reviewing how Glassdoor changed the game initially when yeah. it was founded. And let's just start there. Yeah. So I joined Glassdoor in 2015 and that was about seven years after Glassdoor was founded. But you know, I think the early insight of the founders of Glassdoor, Robert Homan, who was the CEO of Glassdoor, is he tells that is this, this realize that the when you go out to get a job, the whole transaction is very lopsided. The, the company knows everything about you. They've got your resume, they've got your LinkedIn profile, they offer references, they quiz you on a whole bunch of stuff. And yet you from the outside have very little access to really know what's going on in the company. Is it a great company to work for? Is the salary they're offering me a fair compensation for my role? Or is it less or more than what you know, other people who are similar to me earn? And so that was the idea of Glassdoor. We can even the playing field here. We're going to drive more transparency in the workplace. And by doing that, I'll allow people to ultimately find a job and company that they'll love. One where they really gel with the company and one where they get paid fairly. And the belief is this is not just going to be great for job seekers and employees, but ultimately great for companies as well, because at the end of the day, companies want to connect with people who are going to be a great fit for them. So if you can create a platform that drives this transparency earlier in the process, it'd be really you know, a, bit, a bit of a game changer. And so that's what attracted me to join back in 2015, because I wanted to be part of this movement in the same way I'd seen you know, LinkedIn grow and become pretty transformational for the world of work and the world of recruiting. I saw the same potential for Glassdoor. And, and I think now eight years beyond that, and I think it's certainly true that things have played out that way. It's something that we at Glassdoor are really proud of. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think from a candidate perspective, it, it makes a job seeker perspective, it makes a whole lot of sense. I think sometimes executives at companies may not understand the full value of investing in Glassdoor and investing in, in taking feedback from Glassdoor to make the their organization better. The reality is I feel like the best category leading organizations understand that transparency needs to be a two-way street. Yes. And and so that's, I think, a, a mindset shift that I think more companies are getting it now than even maybe yes. did five years ago. I've seen a big For shift. Sure. As you said, right? Like companies, they want your employment history, performance references yeah. for the past 10 years. And then a candidate yeah. asks, hey, are you, what's your runway? Are you profitable? Yeah. Like, yeah. What's, yeah, like, what's it like to work here? Do, yeah. Do, is it an intense culture? Do people work really long hours? Are people good to each other? What's the leadership like? And so many questions that people have. Yeah, totally. And to your point around that, I, I think there has been this shift in the mindset of leadership over time. They thought embrace transparency and really embrace Glassdoor. And I'd say, you know, rewind when I began, I think there are a lot of companies who are very tentative with their relationship with Glassdoor. And fast forward to today where the best companies, they all have a Glassdoor strategy. They all actively want to engage with us they can see the win now. And the other part of it, I think we've also shown, and this is a lot of our academic research, is that we find we have data that shows that the companies that perform the best when it comes to their overall Glassdoor rating as a reflection of their employee experience, they're the companies that outperform other companies when it comes to stock market performance and shareholder performance. And so there's this great narrative now that's in the data shows that if you create a great working experience, that will lead to you looking after your shareholders. And, and, you know, and it's logical. You create a great workplace. You attract the best employees who want to come work for you. They stay with you longer. They're more productive. And so as a result, your company performs better. And I think that's, the, that's where I think it's really dawned on leaders and employers over time that there's a real win if we embrace transparency and try and create great workplaces for people. 
I, I think that we also need to realize that the idea of experience and performance are not two separate conversations. Employee experience and performance are not two separate conversations. Right. Candidate right. experience and performance aren't because when you get right. experiences for people on the candidate side, which I know there's also options to leave reviews for the quality of the interview process, even if before people are employees, that's that stuff's incredibly important because if you're able to provide great experiences to candidates, you're going to get higher, more relevant talent yeah. down funnel and you're going to convert them into top talent. And I think that's just incredibly important. I think that sometimes executives don't even understand a blind spot there. For instance, like if experience isn't great, you might have some really talented folks drop out of your interview process. And maybe you look down funnel and you look at who's in your final round and you have one really great person. Maybe you could have had three and you're mm. not going to really know that mm. without having some sort of like feedback loop. And then also just yeah creating great experiences to get the best people on your team. And you're right. Like great, for instance, like the idea of an employee experience, right? If you create a great onboarding experience, it's really easy to look at sales, right? If you create great onboarding experiences for salespeople, it also decreases their ramp time so that they can be productive faster. You're creating a better experience for the employee, but you're yes. also potentially creating more revenue and growth for the organization. So again, to me, it's experiences and outcomes. It's the same conversation. When you want better outcomes and performance, start with experience, right? Honestly. Right. And I also like that you point on the, you use that word relevance of, it is about fit as well. And it's not like there's a single way in which you create a great workplace. Your company is going to have a different strategy to other companies and you might have a different employee engagement strategy to other companies. And if you look on our platform, we have all different types of companies who have great glass door ratings. Some who are like really intense, in have intense workplaces. For example, Bain and Company, the management consultant company, were really renowned for really long hours and intense work schedules for, for the employees. You have to travel a ton as well. Uh, they're often, they've actually been number one on our list of best places to work more than any other company. And what they've done is they've been able to attract the types of people who want to actually work those hours, who want to have the Bain experience. And I think lots of other, there are other companies, sometimes they get dismissed for being too intense or having a certain way in which they do business. But it's, I think, better for employees to have eyes wide open when they're going in and, and deciding to join that company. That's the employee experience they want to have. And there might be other companies who have fantastic work-life balance. And there are some employees who flock to those companies as well. And they can do great on Glassdoor when it comes to their ratings as well. But I think that that idea of fit and relevance is what is, is most important. And it just comes back to transparency. If you're upfront on the type of your company you are, you will attract the right people for you. And you'll also have, make sure that the people who aren't a great fit, you know, don't, don't apply or don't, don't come through and get shocked on day one when they realize this is not the company they signed up for. And I also think it's important to share the challenges that your organization is having. Yes. No, no company's perfect. Right. And it's okay to have significant challenges. Every yeah. company does. They're going to have real problems. And the reality is you want people on your team that are passionate about solving for those problems. Yes. And if you don't share those problems with folks, not only during the interview process, but through other avenues and channels of transparency, for instance, like Glassdoor, like you're not necessarily going to get the people that you, first of all, you don't want somebody to be blindsided by a challenge, yeah. but even a, the layer beyond that is that you want people that are excited about, okay, yes. this is a big challenge that the company is working through right now. I think I can be a value add in helping to solve for that. And I feel like that's sometimes a missed opportunity. It's we we're always a lot of times when we're, pitching or selling a company in terms of, Hey, come work here. It's of course, we're focusing on all the cool things that we're doing, but it's okay to also dial into, Hey, here's the things that we're, we're it's a current challenge. Like here's our strategy to make it better, but we're looking for yeah. great people that can help us make it to the next level. I think it's, I think being more open about your challenges is very much tied to your leadership maturity. I think early on as a leader, you feel like you need to control all the information. You need to control the message. And because it's really scary to think, oh, if I'm open about this stuff, people will know that we're not doing well over here, or this is really challenging. But then I think as more, more mature leaders realize is that if you actually embrace being more transparent, sharing these issues, I think Brene Brown talks about vulnerability a lot. And just, I think it's you know, a very similar kind of message of leaders who can act with vulnerability, who can share this, end up connecting better with candidates or with their employees. And also you have this knock-on effect of then your employees will take on the challenge with you and they'll partner with you on solving these challenges. And 
I, that's what I see in the best leaders is they really embrace being open, being transparent so that they can pass information more freely so that everybody knows where everything stands and that we can all go and tackle the most important challenges together rather than being just spoon fed the, the little bits of information that leadership wants you to know, which I think is a very old school way of trying to run a company. All right. I think so. As a business owner, I don't get terribly upset if I get a negative glass door review. I don't get defensive about it. It's okay to get some negative feedback too. And in fact, yeah. I think when people are looking at Glassdoor, they want a realistic perspective. They're not just yeah. looking for it. They want to say, okay, but what's, what about an experience that didn't go great? How come? And then what's the response of the company to that individual? And I think the responses to a review, which isn't great, will tell you a lot about the leadership style too. Yes. And it, you want, I think you want to work for a company too, that says, you know what, I'm sorry you had this experience and this is the context of where the company was at, what we think might have happened. And it's a situation in which the company can make an improvement to basically say, hey, this is what we've learned from this. And we're talking with employees and this is what we're implementing as a result of that. And we really appreciate the feedback or either way, it's regardless of how you need to handle the message, I think in response, there's opportunities there to have a genuine conversation. And I, I don't think anybody expects a company or a leader to be perfect. But no. I think that they're also looking at like, how are you going to respond? Which the reality is like every company is going to have a challenge or isn't going to be able to create quite honestly, a great experience hundred percent of the time. That's never happened. It never will happen. You can yeah. be a great company to work for, but there are going to be times in which there's challenges. And, and again, like I think that how you respond to that is ultimately more important. And it's also you no, know, it's showing that you're listening to employees and that you're yeah. all consistently working on improving. I, I had a customer back in. 2018, it's a category leading SaaS company that ended up IPOing. They hired mm -hmm. in some external leaders and just wasn't the right fit. At least oh. that's the message I heard from the, the leaders that were there after this. And it, it messed with the culture and they went through a hiring sprint and then they ended up having to let go a fair amount of people because some of the wrong, the, the, the unrelevant people or the people that weren't the right fit were brought into the organization. And their glass door got hammered by people oh. criticizing the leadership and this, that, and the other. And I'll be honest, like from a recruiting standpoint at first, like it really did, it, it hurt. But yeah. what we ended up doing is the leaders responded. And then on the interview process, they also had a very clear roadmap of, Hey, this is what we're doing about it. And this is how we are in a different place today and how we're going to continue to be able to improve. And quite honestly, I think it took. It, it three from three months to 12 months, like we saw drastic, like consistent improvements in terms of how employees interacted with that. And I think in the long run, it actually helped create a better company because it, it showed again, okay, what is leadership now doing about that? I love hearing stories like that, where you know, it's a much more evolved attitude to getting feedback recognizing that it's not about even trying to manipulate a glass door or rating or score it's actually about going and solving the employee issues and then then that employees start to engage more and then you should just see that your glass door score will, will follow and i think that's the ideal case is that there's leaders like you and, and others in companies who have that more evolved perspective on the flip side i have a lot of empathy i've myself received harsh glass door reviews and and it stings it can be personal and i think that's in the moment it can feel personal but I think what I'm better at now than say when I first took over as CEO of Glassdoor was I can see the forest from the trees and say, and then look at this as a gift, like all feedback and, and it's something where you, you look to try and improve from it and create a better employee experience, knowing that's actually going to be great for the business as well. And so that's generally the, you know, the perspective I try and have. And I think that, that you have as well, but I have a lot of empathy that takes, takes time to get there and you know, time can be hard and, and, and to you know, receive um, constructive feedback. Yeah, no, I'll be honest. There's been a few times, right, where it can be a little challenging to, uh, it hurts. It does yeah. hurt, but I think it's, and sometimes, I don't know, of course, there's been a couple of times where I don't necessarily agree, mm -hmm. um, but I think still what I end up trying to do is go through the motion of saying, okay, this isn't my perspective or worldview, but let me really try, like, in order, if even let's say I'm like, it's not ever so black and white as saying this is right, this is wrong, but I do believe in the thought process of, okay, in order to prove myself, let me try to prove myself wrong first. So I can actually yeah. be confident in how I'm going about solving an issue. Yeah. So I'll go through what's, what are all the reasons this individual might be right? Like yeah. really That's trying right. to dive into it and maybe somebody's hurt on the other side of it. Maybe they're hurt. So it's, yeah. it's like, maybe, okay, the feedback isn't actionable for a reason that maybe from your perspective as a leader, you understand, but 
okay, how did what happened lead to that kind of more so emotional response? Like right. what, what experiences could we have done to, maybe it was a communication thing. Maybe if we're saying to ourselves, that's not what happened or that's not what we were doing, then maybe there's a breakdown in communication somewhere along the line where employees don't feel like they're necessarily in the loop or they have a yes. different idea of how the company is being run. Yes. And that's happened to me. I'll be honest. That's happened to me a couple of times where I received the feedback of maybe a strategy isn't being executed properly or Mm -hmm. why are we investing our energy here versus here? And in my head, I'm like, I know this, I know why we are. And I feel somewhat confident in that because we've given it a lot of thought. I've talked to a lot of advisors. We've talked to customers and then the feedback, the, the next layer of it is how well did I communicate that? Yeah. And that, yeah. that's happened to me more recently where I'm like, okay, so maybe what I learned from this isn't necessarily, I can't make the adjustment that's in the review. However, the adjustment that's like the layer deeper is we need to figure out how we're going to communicate moving forward to make sure that we're completely aligned with our team and everybody knows why we do the things we do. Yeah. I, I think that's a super thoughtful way of approaching it. And it could be communication. It could just, and then the other part of it, is it just a one review? Is it just one person saying this? Or is there a chorus of voices saying this? And that's where also I think other tools as well. The Glassdoor is, is one resource you can do to get feedback on how your employees are um feel right now and there are other ways you can get feedback as well you can obviously just talk to employees you can do internal pulse surveys of employees but i think having an attitude of where you embrace that where you want to learn from that and as you said it's not necessarily means that employees don't like this therefore you change strategy it just i'm trying to understand what it, where is the point of view coming from that people aren't aren't on board is it a communication issue are there other things that you just unintended consequences or decisions you've been making that you need to bring to light? Or is it just frankly, look, there's going to be some pain with this decision and you stand up and you say, okay, that's the thing we need to lead through right now. But irrespective, I think that's the role of leaders is to take on feedback and to actively seek it out. And I think Glassdoor is you know, just an incredible leadership tool for people if they take that attitude to embrace the, the, the content we have on our platform. I think that's a great conclusion to the first segment. I, I love that part of the conversation. That's really cool. I, I want to to transition into a conversation about the future of recruitment, future of employment, hiring, employee experience. Yeah. yeah. And and maybe start high level about your thoughts on how the future of work, buzzy terms we can get a little deeper into, sure. but sure. Uh, how what does that look like over the next several years? And then I would love to to hear from you and how Glassdoor is going to continue to be that incredible resource for candidates, employers, what product roadmap do you have? What focus does the company have? So I guess starting with the high level, what's the future of work going to look like? And then what is Glassdoor doing to empower folks to, to make the most out of their careers and to grow their companies and these types of things? Yeah. Love the question. And it's one we think about a lot and frankly has, it's been through thinking about this question that we've started to evolve our strategy for Glassdoor and where we want to take the, the platform I think you, I rewind back to COVID times in 2020, and we're thinking a lot about Glassdoor's direction. We'd seen this seismic shift in how people would work. It was forced upon us that all of us had to start working from home and we couldn't go into the office. But then since then, in a post-COVID world, it's really fundamentally changed how people work. And it's, I think it's still shifting. And I think it may be the pendulum swinging a little bit back. You see some companies asking people to return to office. But I think we can all confidently say that the world of work in the future is going to be very different to 2019 and before. We're not going to go back to 2019. There are big swaths of the uh, kind of a, the, the job market that have actively embraced remote work, big swaths that have actively embraced some hybrid culture. Um, and even the ones who are largely returning to an in-office culture, I think even they, just by virtue of that, their talent competitors uh, offering more flexibility will be offering more flexibility. And so there is just a, a higher degree of flexibility in the future of work um, than we've ever seen before. And so I think that comes with a ton of advantages for both companies and for people. I think for companies, it opens up new talent pools they can be tapping into. If they start even thinking about embracing more remote, sorry, asynchronous type work arrangements, I think that can also lead to unlocking different forms of productivity. And I think while there's a lot of things that we do really well synchronously, I think it's for many companies overdone. And I see that this is changing as well. But on the and on the con side, I'd say that the from the employee experience, despite all the flexibility you get, what we've seen, and we see this on our platform in Glassdoor reviews, 
is that people feel more disconnected from their workplaces and from their colleagues than ever before. So we've seen uh, people talk much more about these concepts of burnout at, at higher rates in, in workplace reviews or feeling lonely or feeling isolated. And these terms come up in more reviews than we've ever seen before. And it makes sense. I think back to my own experience, 2019 before I was from the office every single day, having the, the banter, having that energy that you get from being around other people. It's very different to today where Glassdoor is now a largely remote based workplace. And uh, I don't get that energy and I even feel a, a little bit disconnected. And so I think that's a major change in the, the, the a change we're stiff, we've seen and will be a big part of the future of work as well. Another major change we've seen in the last few years is, and I think it's both related to the this newer generation of workers who want to be more, bring their whole selves to work and want to be able to talk about a, a, set of, a whole set of topics related to their work and life in the workplace more so than ever before. Topics we would have typically thought of as taboo, topics like the politics or all these other social issues have now become something that people are looking to talk at, at work. And people are also expecting their leaders to talk about at work or even have a stand on. We've seen research that shows that you know, people feel more disconnected from traditional sources of leadership like governments, leadership in governments or even leadership in religions. And so therefore, you know, they turn their attention to their workplace leaders to fill that void and therefore have a stand on many um, social issues. And so I think that's a trend that um, is only increasing, not decreasing. And so I think the, as, a, as a result of that, the workplace and what a company stands for is much more than just a narrow concept of its business, but also its values are now more front and center in how it attracts talent and how it, it conveys itself to the world. And so these are probably the, you know, the, some of the biggest trends that we've seen at Glassdoor. And I can talk a little bit later around some of how it's that therefore that's evolved, how we think about our product. But yeah, I think we're frankly seeing the, the biggest shift in the workplace experience in these last few years than I've ever experienced in the many decades that I've worked. And I think it's true in multiple generations, probably going back to the time of probably around World War II when we saw disruptions of this nature. Yeah, it's really interesting. And some of these are pretty big problems to solve for when in terms of people not feeling like they're able to engage with their team quite as much and, and how that is shifting company culture. I think a lot of people, despite maybe feeling like it's harder to engage and feeling a little disconnected, yeah. People also like multiple things can exist at once. People can be yeah. really happy with the flexibility, getting yeah. back the commute time, which is insane when you do the math on how many hours you get oh, back. Your waste, right. Yeah. And two with parents thinking about right. You know, if you're if your kids at, at daycare or at school, it's you have a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the evening, and that's it. And if two of those hours or possibly more are commuting, it's a lot of time. That could be with your family or doing something healthy for yourself or these types of things. So I mm -hmm. think most people would agree that that's great that we're getting as a society, essentially, we're getting a lot of time back, but specifically getting into to Glassdoor, I, I know you have a, more of a new community mm -hmm. feature that you're rolling out. And is that correlated? Is that to essentially help solve for this issue? And, and if so, how are you doing that? Yeah, it is. And I think it's there's kind of two of those issues that I raised, one around the feeling of disconnectedness in the workplace and the other around wanting to have real conversations about a broad range of topics. And so what we've embraced is bringing more conversational content into the platform so that people can view Glassdoor as a, a community for workplace conversations. So not just a place you go post reviews or share your salary, but a place where you can go and connect with people and, and have chat back and forth. That could be, there's different types of communities that kind of started to evolve in this concept. One of the most important communities is the, you, the, the employees you work with, so your colleagues. So we've created these, what we call company bowls, which are a private space just for verified employees of your company where you can converse with one another. And similar to where an anonymity has been a big part of Glassdoor from the beginning, we, we see anonymity being a really important part so people can have real conversation without fear of, of being reprimanded by leadership so they can really speak truth to power in, in that sense. And so we found that these company bowls, an incredibly vibrant set of communities once they get going. But we also want to have communities, not just within your company, but across industry as well, or interest areas. And you know, if you work in tech, there's a tech company bowl. If you work in recruiting, there's, and there are HR bowls. And then there's also ones for interest areas, like women in or, or affiliate groups, affinity groups, like women in tech or real estate investing and things of that nature. 
And, and we see that in all these different types of communities, it's just a really vibrant conversation. I think filling this void for the fact that we're not having these types of conversations in the workplace in a physical sense anymore, but we still want to be having these conversations. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, that employees probably are going to like the idea that it's a, Lester is a totally separate company that's unaffiliated with the HR people team or whoever's reading right. through the feedback because there's employee surveys that are anonymous and whatnot, right? And there's different tools out there. But I think the idea of having Glassdoor is really trusted as a an external resource that's completely yeah. affiliated where people are already used to sharing different types of feedback, right? Particularly challenges that they're going through. So I, I think people would like the idea of it being through Glassdoor versus in a survey that's sent out by their employer. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think it's nice that this is not a tool that your employer has told you to go use, like their internal survey tools. But frankly, as a leader, I can tell you that and I, I assume most leaders would operate this way as well. Is that, that when you send out an internal survey, you're not going to break anonymity and break users to employees' trust. But I think for employees, they may not always have that trust. And so they do like the idea of a really a third-party platform that they've engaged with, that it's not something their employer told them to use, they can come to, and then there, and there's, a, there's a high degree of anonymity. Within our community, we actually create the option for people to choose a level of identity. So you can be purely anonymous, or maybe you want to post as working from your company or your particular role, or if you choose, you can post in, into the community with your identity. So I can I often post as Christian Sutherland Wong, particularly when I'm talking within our own Glassdoor employee bowl, is that I want people to have full transparency. That's it's my voice they're hearing. But it really depends. And I think anonymity, for in some cases, it can be great for providing safety. But also, I think anonymity is a great in terms of levels of playing field. It makes every voice matter. And often when you don't have a platform like that and you have a, a leader come in, their voice carries more weight. It's really nice. It doesn't matter if you're a, uh, the, the top of the leadership team or you're just a frontline employee, everybody can have the same voice in this community. And I think that's one of the, the most powerful aspects of giving people control over how they ch choose to identify themselves when they post. And so are most of the posts centered around asking questions or what, what are some of the more specific use cases? Like how, how are people using it? Yeah, great question. Yeah, a, a lot of it is asking questions, people looking for support. So one of the biggest use cases, not surprisingly, because we're Glassdoor, is people who are researching companies and jobs and they're looking for information about a career switch. So they're, they're trying to get some information from people. But there's also, it's, it goes beyond just, I'd say, strictly the jobs transaction. People talk more broadly about their careers and even more into other stuff that you talk about at work. If you remember back in the days when we were in the office, we would talk about sport on the weekend or that the, the the football game or things like that. And so there's that type of banter also comes onto the platform and people talking about you know, a whole set of topics. Um, and, and then there's you know, the more lighthearted stuff where it's not necessarily a question, but more of a meme or a, a funny post that people are just sharing to create you know, a bit of levity as well. So it's a range of things, but I think a lot of it is utility where people are trying to get some advice for their career, get some advice for maybe a job switch, and they're leveraging the power of the community to, to help them get informed. So for, for uh, people that are part of the same employer that are leveraging one of these, what, a bowl, are they, are there several channels per se, or I, I don't know if mm. there's some people are asking questions about career progression or, or possibly transitioning into a different department. Is that part of the same conversation thread or is it as somebody who's talking about something more lighthearted or is it conversations segmented out? How does that work? Yeah. So it's evolving, but I'd say that first insight is that it actually mixes really well to have the lighthearted stuff mixed in there with the more utility stuff on, Hey, have a question about my career or have, you know, have a point of view on this in response to what's to, to some recent leadership news or the other, in addition to having the lighthearted stuff, having it all mixed together, I think works really well. We are thinking of like, you get really big companies on the platform in you know, a 10,000, hundred thousand person employee company we do start to see the need to create these channels on maybe this is more relevant to a particular part of the team, a particular location or a particular function. And we've experimented, even at Glassdoor, we have different functions who've created their own sub channel or sub company bowl for just their department. And they converse that way, but we're still evolving exactly how it all fits together because I even find that sometimes some of the stuff that you find in say what the product leader, the product managers are talking about, be great for the broader company to, to hear and vice versa. It's something we're, we're still figuring out, but uh, I think it's 
what's most powerful is that people want to have these conversations yeah. with their colleagues. Yeah, for sure. I think it's naturally going to evolve based on where we're well, seeing the most engagement, right? Like where yeah. are people actually using and engaging the most? And then it, it'll be cool to see how that evolves over the next several years. Yes, yes. Cool. So anyways, look, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. We're coming up on time. And I know you've shared a ton of really valuable insight and some interesting stories too on the evolution of Glassdoor and LinkedIn. So I know everybody tuning in is going to get a lot of value from this. Christian, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, James. Of course. And for everybody else tuning in, make sure to continue to tune in over the next few weeks. We have a lot of really exciting episodes coming up. We have Dan Chait, uh, co-founder and CEO of Greenhouse coming back on. Steve Bartell, uh, co-founder CEO of Gem. Uh, coming on. And then we also have uh, C-Levels coming on from GoPro, DocuSign. And we also have Amit, who's a good friend of mine, who's the CEO of Tenable, which is a, a publicly traded cybersecurity company you may have heard of. So we're going to continue to bring on some amazing folks to add value to you. Thank you for being part of our community. And we'll talk to you next time. Take care.